I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Robert Foffman, who knows that every place, every building has a story and has great respect for that. Thank you. I turned 60 a couple weeks ago. <laughs> My sisters are still mad at me because I don't have any gray hair yet. Here. Um, when you turn 60, I, um, we've been going through a lot of parent care issues, and one of the things that we notice um, is that as you get older, your long-term memories, your early memories become more vivid, and your short-term memory shrinks. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> um, and so my earliest memory was uh, in a window in my grandmother's house. We lived, had an extended family, and we lived with my grandmother. My father was going to school at Northeastern in Boston. And um, I would always look out this window and see this radio beacon flashing in the distance and the stars. And this is the Sputnik era. And I really wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> but I was always framed within that window. That window is something I fixated on as my earliest memory. And uh, so there's a whole series of windows uh, in, in these stories, uh, stories in these windows. And um, so my grandmother um, was, uh, her husband died when she was uh, young and she had to become an entrepreneur. She was an interior designer. And I helped her decorate windows, put in uh, cornices and um, window dressings, all kinds of things. She did mostly colonial homes in New England. So I traveled around with her and learned uh, about the architectural styles of the New England homes. And um, then fast forward to, um, and, and she was a classic New Englander, um, a great storyteller, unlike me, and uh, very gruff, and, uh, and at the same time, um, very passionate about what she did. We called her, she had the gift of gab. <laughs> um, and uh, so when you fast forward, I decided to go to Syracuse University in architecture. And uh, this was in the first energy crisis in 1974. And um, so I was immediately immersed in the first attempt in architecture schools to begin to deal with sustainability. And um, I ended up um, meeting the director of the facilities planning department at Syracuse University. I ended up working work study and then full time um, at the university. And my first job was to inspect windows and dormitories. <laughs> <laughs> Not an exciting job, but then I start to connect these things together. Um, and also at the same time, a classmate of mine a couple years ahead had this newfangled Apple II computer. And um, he said, I'm the energy coordinator for the university. I went, what is that? <laughs> and my boss was very interested in historic preservation. And she was restoring a house. Her name was Ginny. And Ginny smoked cigars. She drove a ru rusty Jeep. And she was restoring a cobblestone house out in Fayetteville, New York, outside of Syracuse. And so I would go out with her to her house to watch her make horsehair plaster and cut nails. I mean, she was into it, seriously. And so we'd come back to the university, and she knew every inch of the university. And so that's where a lot of my preservation ethic started. And the, the sort of culmination or the merger of um, interest in history and, and that passion for place merged with the question of sustainability was we also did an energy model for a, the Unit School of Architecture. Um, it wasn't for the School of Architecture, there was no researchers, it was just the facilities folk that got a grant to weather strip windows. And so we took that Apple II and we calculated and came back very proudly and said, there's a five foot hole in the side of Slocum Hall, the School of Architecture, because we calculated all the little cracks around all the windows and figured out that if we weather stripped the windows, we could save a lot of energy. And um, so that really carried through through all my whole career, these little incidents around windows. And then um, I left Syracuse um, and came to Pittsburgh. My wife is from Pittsburgh, and uh, I had the good fortune to connect um, with Peter Bowen and then to Carnegie Mellon, with people like Volker and Vivian and got an opportunity to learn about what they were doing and had the unique opportunity to work on the intelligent workplace. Um, had a huge ripple effect on my career and I got to follow Volker around Germany at 100 miles an hour in a Volkswagen, you probably don't remember this, <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> I had never... <laughs> <laughs> 
and I got to go to the labs at, at uh, the research facilities um, for the curtain wall company that I'm sorry I've forgotten. Gartner, thank you. And we got to help the lab-coded engineers design a new window. And in this case, this is called the water million, right, Booker? And so the idea of integrating heating and cooling into the envelope of the building, I kind of love that picture because it looks like a human being, right, <laughs> with a head. And um, so the, um, the, the, the story is also, I think, tied to sort of both the left brain and the right brain side of, of looking at design from um, the intuitive side as well as the rational side. You need the science and the engineering, but you also need uh, the art of, of design. And so that, that really has had an influence on me um, throughout my career. Maybe the next slide I can look at here. Um, my passion for preservation and this interest in building performance uh, in a small architectural practice where there's limited means uh, sort of connected me to a couple of really important places in Pittsburgh. One is Rachel Carson's homestead. How many of you have been to the homestead? Great. Um, I had an opportunity to um, help uh, get a grant and uh, restore the windows in the house. And the first time I went into the house and went upstairs to her bedroom and looked out that window, I knew I had found Rachel Carson. So it's pretty cool. And that picture is nothing like what she probably saw. It was probably much darker and grayer. There probably weren't leaves on the trees. Um, but she was also looking at the beautiful orchard around her and the, the wisdom of nature around her. But I've always enjoyed um, that window. Uh, and it means a lot to me in my practice and thinking about that. Um, so the, um, we keep coming back to these windows. Um, the next house is August Wilson's house just down the street here. And I got involved in that. Um, actually, Terry Baltimore was very helpful. Um, we designed the Hill Library. And uh, is Afton here? Do I see Afton? Yeah. <laughs> Afton was involved in that. And we um, really started to immerse ourselves. I think one of the things that um, is great about being an architect is you get to get into other people's business. You get to <laughs> other people's cultures, other people's places. And so you really get to explore and, and, and develop a little diversity of interests. And working on the Hill Library, we learned about August Wilson. And I met, ran into Christopher Rawson, uh, PG Post Gazette critic that has worked with Larry Glasgow on the uh, history of August Wilson and the Hill. And that led me, uh, after the um, Hill Library, to help with an historic structures report for August Wilson's house. And this is an ongoing project right now. And what's so cool, that's the set for seven guitars on the right, and on the left is the rear of the house. How am I doing on time? <laughs> And so this is an ongoing project. I was just over there today. We're hoping to actually have seven guitars performed at the site this summer in August. And so the last slide is probably closer to what some may know about me as an advocate for historic preservation. You notice I haven't mentioned the Civic Arena yet? <laughs> There's, I'm going to mention it. <laughs> so this is my office window. And the view on the right is uh, Market Square, and that's the view I used to have. And the view on the left is the window that used to show that view. And those are the windows of our building, the Benedum Trees building. And I'm a 13th owner of that building, which is cool. Um, but we, um, as a condo association, we had a challenge that a great new green building was going up next to us. And it was taking one hole five feet away from us. and so. I guess what I'm tying all these windows together is that we need to think about windows not in terms only of their energy performance and their cultural importance, but also how they connect to the health of our lives inside buildings. And that this needs to be part of uh, the way we think about green building. And so that building I'm hoping was inspiring to go forward. Um, it's on Fourth Avenue, so we've created an organization called Go Forth. And the idea is to begin to bring all the new residents that are now living there and all the small businesses uh, together to advocate for the uh, quality of life on that street, its historic presence, and uh, to make the history known of that place. So the, 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 I'll leave you with the idea that we all hear about eyes being um, you know, part of your, you know, the eyes of the soul, the, the connection to your soul. And I think windows are the connection to the soul of a building. Thank you.
reactions? Are stories a window into our souls? A little bit. Rob Foffman's soul is built on buildings. <laughs> Any feedback for Rob? Nothing. Nobody wants to share. Oh, you were a good storyteller. There you go. You got some validation. <laughs> so, what is a place you love and why? My workshop. I say something now that I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> one word, Wilker. I just one. For those of you who didn't hear that, we should be supporting what new buildings can be and what old buildings can be and what they can be together. Right. Sort of my interpretation. Um, <laughs> so, what's a place you love? My workshop because I can be creative and solve problems. I love the Melwood Road from Polish Hill to Oakland because it's like a wormhole from one community to another. I love Pittsburgh's convoluted topography and pathways. I remember when I was new to Pittsburgh and you know you have, this is before Garmin's really, you know the map, you're trying to get places and you're like okay I'm gonna get there from here and you're like where's this road? Oh. <laughs> And leading into our next storyteller, what's a place you love and why? Carnegie Library in Oakland, because it's always filled with people excited to learn, teach, read, and share. It has a great sense of community.